Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church Grove City as we gather uh, this Sunday morning to dig into the Word of God in this uh, still continued lockdown time and uh, I guess our new way of meeting and gathering via the internet. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're still in First Peter uh, as we work our way through there. Follow along with me as I read from 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 6 through 12. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had suffering, or you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you loved him, and even though you did not see him, not, you do not see him now, you believe in him, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that have now, that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Spirit sent from heaven, even angels look, long to look into these things. Today we're going to talk about why we can not only endure trials, but rejoice in hope in the midst of trials. In the early 1500s, there was uh, a lot of change going on in the church, right? Luth men like Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, they sought to build on the, the process that guys like Huss had started before them to bring about change and religious change in the Roman Catholic Church and along with the papal authority in particular. It started out in Germany and spread throughout Europe and as these Protestant movement moved out and spread out it began to grow like wildfire from country to country. And in that time frame there was a small group of French men, they called themselves, well French men and women, that called themselves the Huguenots. They were followers of what John Calvin had taught and they believed that it was their freedom to have religion and to meet and gather and follow the, the Word of God outside of the Roman Catholic Church. But in those times, uh, in the, the mid-1500s when they began to grow as a group, there was a theory throughout the land that was basically went something like this, I can't pronounce the Latin because I'm not that good, but it's whose realm, his religion. So whoever was in charge of the country at that time, his religion was the religion of the nation and that was what there was. There was no other choice. So the Huguenots, as they called themselves, their church started out in the, the 1550s, right around there, a few small churches, but by 1561, they had over 2,000 churches that were represented at the Synod meeting that year. But for the Huguenots, their uh, journey was not an easy one. They alternated between high favor and outright persecution throughout the years. Inevitably, there was clashes between the Roman Catholics in the country and the Huguenots, many times erupting and ending in the shedding of blood. One particular day in August, the Huguenots had gathered for a, a wedding. There was large numbers of them, thousands. Uh, and Roman Catholic uh, mobs and soldiers swooped in and it became a, just a slaughter of the people. Thousands would be killed because their simple faith that they had. 
In April 13, 1598, the newly crowned Henry IV sought to bring a change to all the religious warfare that was going on at the time, and he signed or issued the Edict of uh, Nan Nantes, which at the time was pretty dramatic because it granted the Huguenots toleration and liberty to worship in their own way. That would last for about a hundred years. Then things would take a pretty significant change. See, uh, Henry the Fourth's great grandson Louis the Fourth, or sorry, Louis the Fourteenth, ascended to the French throne in 1643, and persecution began again for the Huguenots. Louis saw the Huguenots as a constant pain and a disrespect to the power of the crown. In fact, he saw it as something that, because their freedom to worship and choose to do religion as they wanted to, was weakness in the crown. So he looked at that edict that his grandfather had passed and had been long-standing since the French Wars of Religion, and in 1681 he decided to end that edict. And along with that, he decided to ramp up the persecution. After all, it was his rule and reign in the country, and his religion was Catholicism. And so, shouldn't everybody in the nation be that? So, one of the things that was unique about that time were, were countries where that was set up and like that. Usually, people who disagreed with the king or with his religion were allowed to immigrate. And that was one of the first persecutions that Louis put in to, to flex his strength and power. He banned all immigration and told the Protestants that they must convert instead of moving. Not only did he not allow them to move, but he took it one step further when he forced them to quarter his soldiers, his dragoons, in their houses. And that last move was with his, within his rights as king, he could do that, but it put immense pressure and financial strain on the Huguenots and abuses on them by having these people live with them and power over them and started to break down. All the Huguenots were also given the opportunity to join Catholicism or face jail. And in that time frame, somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 actually said they converted or switched back, many because uh, there was financial reward and exemption from the dragoons if they did that. But those that didn't switch, that stuck to their faith, even with the prospect of financial reward and sentencing to the prisons or the galley ships, many stuck by their faith. In fact, 1,500 or so men were sent to a life sentence to row on the warships of France. They were shackled to a, and chained to a giant oar that would row and they would row there until the day they died. Women were locked in towers, and in the midst of the ups and downs, the peace and the war, the persecution and the freedom, the Huguenots understood that their hope, our hope, in Christ Jesus points beyond the trials. If you follow back with verse 6 in 1 Peter, it says, And in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials for a little while. We don't know what those trials could be. It could be a weekend, it could be a month, it could be two years, it could be 30 years, it could be 90 years. God does not give us an estimate on the trials we will face and the length that they will be. How amazing would it be if we were going down into those trials and you know you got that ding on your phone you look down and there was a text message from JC himself right because you would have him as a contact in your phone 
You open your phone up and there's a text from him that says, don't worry about it, Josh. This trial is only going to last six months. Jesus Christ. Maybe a couple of emojis behind it, right? Smiley face, thumbs up. Right? You look at that and you say, oh man, thanks Jesus. I really appreciate the heads up. And you know what? We can comfortably sit back and ride out those six months, that year, whatever it is, knowing that it's only going to be for a period of time. The Huguenots understood that any persecution or imprisonment would only be for a while. If you have your Bibles, flip back to Genesis 45 right there at the very beginning of the Bible. And we see one of the greatest examples of trials and facing those trials and at the end seeing and knowing and understanding that our hope is in God to come, not in what's going on around us. Genesis 45, 4 through 8. If you're not familiar with the story, Joseph, as a young boy, has told his brothers that someday they will bow down to him. He's had these dreams. Uh, they don't enjoy his favoritism and power that he has in the family as one of the younger brothers, so they decide they're going to kill him. They don't kill him. They beat him. They throw him in a hole. They sell him into slavery. He goes on to be sold into slavery, be thrown in jail because he did his job. He followed what his master told him to do, and when he wouldn't give in to his master's wife, he was jailed. He sat in jail. He went through different things, trials, abuses. He ends up getting out of jail and becoming second in command in Egypt. And in verse 45, we see in verse 4 through 8, he says this, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine and in the land, and for the next five years there will not be plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Hmm. Joseph realized that all he had gone through, all the pain, the suffering, all the anger he could have had towards his brothers and family for what they did. But no, it was God's plan. And he realized that on the other side, there was even greater things to come. That being sold into slavery, false accusations, jail, God used all of that to bring about his plan. His hope was in Christ, and because of that, he understood that he had a hope in the future. That his pain and struggle here were only for a while. But he had eternity with God coming. Uh, uh, during our community builders, which is our midweek Bible study, we're going through the book of James right now. And James 1, 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, or chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says this. Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. In Matthew 5, 10 through 12, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when, you are in, when people insult you and persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in, in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And in Revelation 3.10, as he's talking to the churches there, we see him say, Because you have kept the word of my per perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. And that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. There's a lot of uncertainty right now, right? Trials of all sorts, and 
Some people have lost jobs, some have lost businesses, some have gotten help, some haven't. Some have been sick, some aren't, right? There's all kinds of trials that we face day in and day out. And we're not sure when this event we're in right now will be over. And some of the faces, trials we face may not even have anything to do with COVID-19. But no matter the trial, no matter the length, no matter what it brings about, we should have hope in the midst of it all. A hope that we know that is just for a time. And that time cannot come close. The trials that we're going through right now to the eternity that we will have with Jesus. So Peter starts this section of the passage with a reminder that we have hope, right? In the midst of all the trials and whatever comes our way, it's just for a time. And that our hope is coming. But he reminds the church in Asia and us today that no matter the trial, we have hope. And that it's just for a tiny bit of time. And even if that little while feels right now like it'll never end, Hope in an eternity with Jesus Christ is what we have. We have a hope in a better future. Peter also gives us another reason to endure and rejoice in the hope when we, that we have during trials. Verse 7 says this. As I turn back to 1 Peter here. Verse 7 says, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which purifies or perishes, even which sorry, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. These have come so that the proven genu the, to prove the genuineness of your faith, the refining fire. Peter reminds us that the pilgrimage that we are on is a journey. And if we are to make it to the end with a faith that endures, then it is a faith that must be purified and stress tested. That's a tough thought to think about. The gold refining process is not a difficult process. I explained to my boys the other day that on certain cell phones and electronics, there's gold that can be melted off, and so they've been hoarding electronics in hopes that we can strike it rich. They don't realize that there's tiny, tiny amounts, but that's a talk for another time. But we've looked into the process of what does it actually take to refine gold down? And it's actually a fairly simple process. But it's a process that requires high heat. You take unrefined gold, you take your different things, you put them in a pot that can handle the heat, you add a little borax and soda ash to the molten metal, and this separates the pure gold from the waste that is in there, the other metals that can be in there, the other things like that. It's maybe a little more in depth than that, but that's kind of the, the general idea. If you look with me, turn to the book of Isaiah, verses 48, or chapter 48, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 11. It says this, For my own name's sake I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise I hold it back from you, so as not to cut you off. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own, for my own, my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. This idea of being refined by fire, the fire doesn't destroy the gold. It changes it. It removes the impurities. Peter reminds us that trials shouldn't catch us off guard or surprise us when they come or cause us even to question God's faithfulness. We, like the Huguenots, should be glad for them. That sounds strange, but 
The Huguenots had opportunity to take the money and run, to walk away from their faith. As I was searching and, and looking up different things about the Huguenots, I came across uh, a memoir from two men who had went through this time frame and had written about it. And just a little glimpse of their story, they get caught. Uh, their, well, it goes like this. Their mother was a widow. She was forced to uh, house some dragoons. She couldn't afford to do that. They took the house away from her uh, and put her kids in uh, uh, the church or in the monastery or uh, that type of situation. These two boys run away. They get caught. They're brought before the governor. And the governor had felt some compassion for what they called heretics at the time. And he took pains to persuade them to walk away. As otherwise they would be condemned to the galleys uh, for attempting to run away and live their faith in another country. And they had evidence of this because they had talked to the boys and had given them these opportunities to walk away before and they said no. And they now were determined to abide wholly by the truth and place their reliance in God alone, they said. We were determined to endure even the galleys or death rather than renounce the faith in which they had been educated. There was actually even several priests brought in and they used every argument they could to convert them and offering bribes, different things like this. One of the Priests even said to one of the men or young boys uh, that he could procure an excellent alliance and said he knew a beautiful woman with a large fortune who would accept him for her husband after he had proved himself a convert to the church. <laughs> the youth rejected this bribe and refused the offer. And in that they were sent to the galley ships. Sentenced to be chained to Rome. It was a trial. It was a test of their faith. And these boys had much to gain from walking away from the fire. Right? They could have been married to a wealthy lady and had a life of relaxation and probably all they could have wanted. Yet they walked away from it. They stepped into the fire because that's what they had been taught. That's what they understood as their faith. They didn't want to lose what they understood. They understood that the trials were part of their faith. They understood not to give in, to stand tall. They, like us, should understand that God does not just send trials to be a thorn in our side, but rather He sends them to strengthen our trust in Him. So like those two boys uh, in prison after prison and finally... Uh, being sent to row in the galley ships, our faith should grow exponentially because of the trials. In the book of Zechariah, in chapter 13, verse 9, it says this, This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is our God. When we face trials, they allow us to keep trusting. To allow our self-confidence to be burned away like the impurities in the refiner's fire. Trials should drive us to the Father instead of away from Him. It's interesting here that Peter in the verse points out one very important thing with the idea of being refined by trials. He points out that our faith is much more valuable than gold. Right in verse, the end of verse 7 there, or right at the beginning, sorry, of, of verse 7. It says, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire. He points out that our faith is more valuable than gold. 
Gold, like all these things, will pass away. We can have all the gold in the world, and at some point, it's all going to be gone. Whether that's when we die, whether we spend it frivolously or do whatever, you can sit on it, and at some point it'll be gone, because it's part of this world. And everything that is a part of our sinful world will one day be gone. But how much more infinitely treasured and more abiding does our faith become if we work through those fires, through those trials? When we walk through the refining fire of trials, the greatness of our faith should shine bright and bring praise to the Father. We know that our trials are just for a time, right? There's greater things to come in eternity with the Father. That trials refine our faith and draw us to the Father. But they should also bring out joy. I'm sure you're shaking your head right now and saying, yeah, right, Josh. That's what I want. Joy in the midst of my trials. I know that when I'm struggling through things myself, the first thing I do is smile and thank the Lord, right? When times are tough, it's a lot easier to jump into my own self-confidence that should have been burnt away instead, and instead smile and thank the Lord, but I don't always do that. Really, joy and suffering are tied together in this passage. The second half of verse 7 says that we may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We have to realize that there is glory and honor that goes to the Father when we suffer. But that does not mean that what we're going through is forgotten. God doesn't look away from the trials we are going through. In Psalm 56 it says this, Fifty-six, verse 8, it says, Record my lament. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? God holds our tears. They're written down and remembered. But Paul speaks of this line of thought also, what Peter is saying in 1 Peter. Paul agrees with and reminds us that in Romans 8.18 8, it, it says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the Son of God to be revealed. Let me read that again. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the Son of God to be revealed. And in 2 Corinthians 4.17, it says this. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul here is coming along with the same line of thought as Peter. Peter saw some pretty amazing things when he walked with Jesus. But nothing greater than when he watched Jesus ascend into heaven and promise his return. Peter understood that the end was coming. And that judgment was a part of that. Someday when God returns and this creation will be gone. And we will see Jesus revealed in a new heaven and a new earth. In all his glory. For those that have a personal relationship with Jesus, that is joy beyond expression, right? To think and understand and know that. For those that do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, that is terrifying. The idea of missing out on an eternity with God the Father is a terrifying thought. There's a museum in southern France. It's called the Museum of the 
desert. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong too, but it commemorates the suffering that the Huguenot martyrs endured throughout that time frame in France. Those that met in secret in fields at night because they weren't allowed to have a building to worship in. There's an oar that hangs in that museum. It's a replica of the oar used in the great ships. Underneath it are the words of one of the mighty men that were shackled to an oar like that. It says, my chains are the chains of God's love. Joy in the midst of suffering. Think about it, being stuck to an oar day in and day out, and you can look at it and say that the chains that hold me here are the chains of God's love. In the midst of those trials, Peter praises those that have not seen Jesus. If you look at, flipping back to 1 Peter, in verse 8 it says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It would be easy to believe, right? Peter had seen Jesus do so many amazing things in those three and a half years. He had seen it with his own eyes. He had seen the resurrected Christ. He sat down and had meals and talked with him before he ascended into heaven. Yet here Peter praises those that have put their faith and trust in Christ for not seeing and still believing. That they, as they are pushing forward through these trials, as they are being refined, they are receiving the goal of their faith and salvation. Lastly here in this chapter, he points out the blessing that we have of coming after the resurrection of Christ. In verse 10 it says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with great care, trying to find out the time and circumstance to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The prophets searched, they looked, they understand, stood the prophecies they were making, but they still sought out, tried to figure out the time to better understand the prophecies they were making. When would this Messiah come and what would happen when that Messiah came? Peter here lets us know that we here have a better understanding now than those prophets. That we can look back, that we can see the fulfillment, the understanding, that we can hear those people who had first-hand knowledge, that had walked and talked with Jesus when He was on earth. And how blessed we are that we have this knowledge and understanding that the prophets didn't have. So much that even the angels long to look into these things. Peter lets us know in this passage that we're going to have trials, but they're for a short time. That the trials we face refine our faith and purify it. And that even in the midst of the struggle, the pain, that we can have joy and endure those trials. We serve a mighty God. As we go through these trials, as we face adversity, I hope we come out shining, refined and refined to the point where we come out shining and bringing honor to God in all we do. That when the people around us that don't know Jesus, that they see us walk faithfully through those trials, that we go through those shining for the Lord, that they seek us out, that they ask, how are we able to do that? And that when that happens, that we are able to share our faith with those that are 
desperate need of them. But our trials are only for a short time. They refine us. They make us better. They strengthen our faith. And even though it may not be fun, we can have joy in the midst of all that. Let's pray.